Hi, folks. I'm here with Sam, a.k.a. The Khaleesi from the Reset Race podcast. And she is here to talk about a really important issue, and that is the disappearance of black wealth in the United States of America. And uh, there's a really clear solution for this. It's reparations. And she has all the details that I think you need to know. Uh, so, Sam, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you so much for having me. Like, I'm really excited to be here. Like, I was telling you, I'm a casual watcher. So I'm like, yay. <laughs> what? I thank, say you. thank you to Brian. Because Brian, when you asked yes. the people, he jumped in right away. So I want to make sure I say thank you to Brian. Shout out to Brian. Brian is very excited that this is happening. Brian is, is great. I love him. He's one of my mods. So yeah, thank you so much uh, for the recommendation. I've heard of the Reset Race uh, podcast before. I didn't know that it was Actify, but rebranded. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I've known Michael Graham for a while. I brought him on the show at one point to talk about reparations. So this isn't necessarily reparations 101 for my viewers. But I, I, since then, I've had more people tune in. And I casually will mention reparations here and there. But I think from time to time, it's really important to revisit it and dive back in because every once in a while, what I'll notice is that there's people that will talk about reparations, but it's not necessarily an intellectually honest conversation. Or if they talk about reparations, it's their interpretation of reparations, which isn't the interpretation of the people who actually are fighting for it on the ground. Eidos 101, uh, the Reset Race podcast. So I, I, I want you to kind of give my viewers the uh, precise definition of reparations um, because there's, and maybe it's not necessarily, maybe it's hard to do that, but oftentimes what I see is reparations broken down into two different distinct categories. Reparations is either one, uh, distributing wealth into black communities that's missing or two, cutting a check. And as my understanding is, it should be both, but ultimately the bottom line is you should cut a check. A check is really what's owed, not just morally, but legally. And there's there's so many different ways that you can attack this argument. Uh, they're all compelling to me. But in your view, what is reparations? And if somebody doesn't necessarily know, how should they understand it? So I, I'm, I'm going to actually pull up the official definition and then I'll go in deeper. There we go. Because I think we should just start with a good old fashioned encyclopedia that's that always the is. safest bet. Yeah. So <laughs> I think it's just easier for people, right? Because yeah. everybody, like, you know, these days people are like, oh, we should do some, we should do a, we should do a housing program. That's reparations. And it's just everything right. reparations. So reparations, just the basic, to, the making of amends for a wrong one has done by paying money to or otherwise helping those who have been wronged. The action of repairing something. So Reparations, the way that Black Americans who descend from chattel slavery, the ADOS movement, the U.S. Freedmen, we are looking for, uh, we are actually looking for multiple programs and also a check to be involved as well. Because the thing about the racial wealth gap is you can't close it with just programs. Because this is the thing. So everybody's like, well, let's give people free college, which, you know, it sounds great, right? Free college, that's the gateway to opportunity. Well, Black college graduates have less wealth than white high school dropouts. So that's not the equalizer. We tried that for 30, 40 years. So it's just, there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of different things that people are like, well, if we do this, we'll give people free college. Oh, well, we can help people with down payments for homes. Well, that sounds great. But if I have a 450 credit score, <laughs> your 25 or $30,000 assistance is not getting me into anything because I have bad credit or or I don't have a good enough job, or I'm not stable. So basically what reparations would do for Black Americans is basically just make us stable. So with Darity's numbers, he's talking about seven around $17 trillion per family. Or not, sorry, not per family, $17 trillion total. So right. for that, I like to look at it as a down payment, but you know, if you, people should go with Darity first because, you know, the rest of us are like, no, we want more. So go with the man who's trying to <laughs> go with the man who's trying to be sensible because we like Thomas Kramer's numbers and he's talking about quadrillion. So, you know, maybe mm. y'all should listen to Darity a little bit more. But um, it would basically be about eight hundred thousand dollars per family. Give or take. And 
that actually when somebody hears that they might think oh that's that's inconceivable in the united states but a lot of people don't realize that we actually did distribute reparations before not to descendants of slaves but to uh the families of victims of japanese internment and the individual who signed that into law the president who signed that into law was ronald reagan of all people so to think that it's inconceivable it's not just in this political context that we're in i feel like we're we're made to believe that this is such a weird, absurd, kooky concept. But it, it's not just a necessity because black wealth is disappearing at a rate that should alarm everyone. But it's also morally ne necessary. And the legal argument is sound. It is what is owed. And it's a debt that has never been paid. And I think that there's there's a variety of ways that you can reason yourself into supporting it legally, morally, out of necessity. But either way, it's something that to me is non-negotiable. And with how fast black wealth is disappearing, I don't see how this isn't a really huge topic. Now, one thing that I wanted to ask you about is for the first time ever in the uh, House of Representatives, there was actually a hearing on HR 40, which yeah. was no, originally not, not the hearing. The hearing was was last was 2019. That was the first one. The markup mm -hmm. was the first markup. Time ever. Okay. Yes. Right. We right. Finally got it to a markup because it's the hearing first, then a markup, then if right. they want to, they vote. Or you hit 218 co-sponsors and they have to vote, which is. Honestly, it's it's incredible to to know that it got that far, uh, mm -hmm. and we're we're far behind. But t the fact that it's there it is great. Talk to us about the significance of that process and your thoughts on how it played out overall, because I think this is really important. Because this is the first time we've seen movement, and all I, that I expected from politicians was for them to try to placate uh, supporters of reparations. But this is a little bit different. We have members of Congress actually pushing it, which is incredible so talk through that process so i'm going to start off by giving yvette carnell credit so yvette carnell basically motivated a lot of people across this country to get active so mm -hmm. basically what happened from there is people started organizing they started doing campaigns i i literally berated my congresswoman on twitter for about four weeks but she was <laughs> like no 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 i already signed hr 40 they just haven't added my name to the list like we literally, because originally I think when it started, when we started dealing with it, had like 40 or 50 co-sponsors, we're up to 196. We, That's incredible. We, we did a campaign. We would call their offices. We had scripts. We had, like, we were not playing around. So we still haven't gotten where we need to be with it. But it, to be honest, it was a grassroots joint effort of a bunch of ADOS people who are like, you are going to pay attention to us and our issues. And we haven't gotten it to the vote yet, but... You know, if we could get what it's like, says I think we have 196. You need 218 to force a vote. So if we can get more people to start calling their congressmen and asking about why they haven't done HR 40, and it'd be great if they're not all black people. If they start hearing from white people about this too, it's gonna matter because a lot of times they feel like, oh, white people don't, white people aren't gonna like this, so I'm not gonna talk about it. So if you start calling them and talking about it, they're gonna be like, uh oh. This is going to be something that I have to add into what's going on. So I'm excited about the movement, but we're still not where we need to be yet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, what I wanted to ask you is in terms of having conversations about reparations, white people, how do we and I mean, I, I'm I'm the white ally, so I'm the one who should be trying to facilitate this. But it's it's difficult because at the same time, I want to be an ally, but I don't want to talk out of turn. Um, so how do you think we bring people on? This is one thing that I that I find um, that is kind of the issue is that people there's this tendency, even on the left, especially on the left, they kind of prioritize universal policies and anything yes. that disproportionately helps one group of people, they, they tend to think, you know what, that's not going to be popular. It's not going to mm -hmm. gain any momentum. But I think that we've really kind of misconstrued what reparations is to an extent, at least as leftists, broadly speaking. I, I don't view this as a race based policy even though it is that right mm -hmm. um this is basically a program that does more than help ados this is a program that would boost the economy yes. overall if okay. black americans have wealth then unlike billionaires they reinvest that into the economy into their exactly. communities and kind of like this is this is like the inverse of trickle down where a rising tide lifts all boats where if you actually invest money into the economy uh black people will spend that money 
in white businesses, in black businesses. Mm -hmm. And so it's not necessarily just um, a, a policy that exclusively uh, benefits Eidos. But at the same time, I, there's the, almost this assumption that we can't walk and chew gum at the same time or this implication mm -hmm. where it's like, well, if I, if I support reparations, then I have to uh, put Medicare for all on the back burner when we need all of it. We Thank need universal you. programs and that. Like, so I mean, <laughs> I feel right now, I'm just like, yeah. listen, there's no, we can no longer do piecemeal anything. So like, right. Reset, Elret reset race, like we're reparations first, but we want a bundle. We're like, give us reparations and like the same day, you know, put the other bill next to it and let's have a federal jobs guarantee and some Medicare for all and some housing as a human right. And like we are we are down for the fight. We are down to yeah. fight for everybody to get everything that their families need. But reparations is the cost of doing business because mm -hmm. historically it's so this is the thing, right? Um when Thomas Kramer who is um who is a I think he's like a historian, but he also is, uh, works on he does some economic work with mm. Garrity, and he talks about reparations and he did calculations. That's how he got to the quadrillion number. So he talks about the reason why he likes um likes America because he's from Germany. The reason why he mm. likes um the history of America so much is because of the fact that there was always white resistance. There was mm. always like the abolitionists. People don't understand that abolitionists, there are white people who died fighting to protect and to secure freedom for black Americans. This country has a rich history of white people fighting with black people. But the problem is we don't really talk about it in history books. It's not something that's really promoted, but this has happened. And we just have to get back to coming together and working together again. You can look at Bacon's mm -hmm. Rebellion when everybody came together, like they rioted for a year. There was a whole rebellion for over a year that it took them to quash. And if we would have won, the you know, it would have been a very different thing. So I think instead of, it's frustrating for me as, as an ADOS person, as US Freedman, it's very frustrating for me because like I want reparations, but I have four white god sisters and they all pretty much have children except for one. Mm. I want their kids to have a wonderful life too. I want their kids to have access to good education because they live in the country. So, you mm. know, they're not city kids and they're not rich people either. So like, I want them to have access to healthcare. I want them to have good resources. I want them to, if they decide they want to go to college, be able to go to college. If they want to stay in their town and work in their town, I want them to be able to do that. So I just don't understand how I can want so much for, for so many people. And it's just such a fight for people to want reparations for us. Even if you're not down for reparations, why don't you just say, okay, well, if you'll fight with us for this, we'll fight with you for that. And let's just call it a deal. And that's that's such a good point to to bring in. I, I mean, the problem with a lot of American politics, maybe not even politics, maybe just American cultures, every single thing is presented as a zero sum game. Yes. If you get something, I lose something. If I get something, you lose something when that's not necessarily it. So when you brought up how this is kind of all part of a package, but you put reparations first, that makes sense to me, because I mean, anyone who's watching this, they're going to be leftist, socialist, communist and they know. I mean, if I could make a list of all the things that we need to do yes. to fix this country, it would be long. So we need a gigantic package. And we're kind of seeing this build back better plan, 3.5 trillion. And it's not it's it's nice to see not enough at all. But it's, I, it's nice so to see we, a bunch of things to get without the racism. Can we bring back the new deal without the racism? It would be <laughs> right. perfect. It would be perfect. They had writers projects. You and I could get some money to do this. People could get money mm -hmm. to, to take care of their grannies. People could get money to read to old people, write scripts, films, open juice bars, food trucks. Like, yeah, let's bring it back. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And that's what that's kind of like something that we need on that scale where yes. we there's so many issues. You can't just address one thing or incrementally address lots of things. We need Medicare for all. We need climate change reform. Yes. We are uh, not reform, but action. Um, yes. We need that's reparations guarantee so we can start rebuilding the infrastructure of the country because we're going to have to move whole groups of people from one place to another in this country. Like we got to stop fighting each other and start getting ready for what's coming. 
Right. And and I, I love the way that you put it. It's like, if you fight for me uh, with me on this, I'll fight with you on that. That's the thing that's missing in modern day politics. And I don't know if it's just the product of the era where there's social media and we're all kind of decompartmentalized. Mm-hmm. We're all in our own bubbles. And so we don't necessarily speak with each other anymore. But I think that solidarity is really lacking, especially with leftists. And really what we have to do is reconnect again as a movement. And it's tough because it's, in my opinion, having a movement flourish, it really does need leadership. Uh, But there has to be some point where all these different groups come together. Mm -hmm. Um, Eidos, uh, the Sunrise Movement, and and they kind of have this solidarity and -hmm. they flex their muscle because together, uh, I think that it actually is doable if there is enough noise and maintain pressure. And that's what I wanted to ask you about with Eidos, because this is the first time that we've ever, or at least as, as long as I've been alive, um, noticed sustained talks of reparations. Sometimes it would come up in presidential campaigns uh, and a politician would signal support for it or they'd shoot it down. But it's only a conversation once every four years. This is the first time where the conversation is still going on. And part of that is, I think, the persistence. Part of that is saying, this is what I want first, period, end of story. And that level of relentlessness, I think, is truly a blueprint for getting things done, keeping it on the agenda. So talk through uh, the Eidos movement in general and why this is issue number one. Because I think that a lot of people with white privilege or who are non-Black, they can't understand it. But put it all in context for us. Well, I get what you're saying. So I know a lot of people are like, well, why can't you just do universal policies? So the best Mm -hmm. way to explain it is we would be the bottom stable poor in your new socialist society. Cause that's pretty right. much how it would work out because unless you're, so listen, this is my thing with the socialists. I don't have a problem with socialists, but some of y'all are democratic socialists and some of y'all are socialist socialists. So you democratic socialists, y'all are not talking about wealth redistribution. So mm-hmm. until you're talking about really going up and really snatching some money from the top and shifting everybody's numbers, I don't want to hear anything because that's the only thing that would actually change. It's just, it's a perfect example, right? If we live on the same block and they say, okay, we're giving everybody $10,000 to fix their house, right? If you already had $10,000 in the bank, you have 20 grand to fix your house. If I had a dollar, I have $10,001. That may not be enough to fix what I need in my house. It, it's just really simple. It's, it's, we are so far behind and people don't even understand. I think People in this country think black people are behind because like we're kind of lazy or we don't really have a good work ethic, but you can trace everything through. So after slavery, we got it together. Like we went off, we started, you know, we started building little towns. We started getting our stuff together. Next thing you know, boom, people come in, they're burning down the town. They're killing people. Like there are so many books that are written. There's this book called Buried in Bitter Waters where he just talks about racial cleansings where he literally was like, okay, first, so basically he only talks about where people over, like, I think over a thousand people got expelled or over a certain percentage of the black population was expelled. Because originally when he first started doing it, there was too many areas. He had to narrow the search so he could actually write a book. And I think he got it down to like 10 places. Uh, Mm. So like Forsyth County, they expelled pretty much their whole black population off of some, some incident with a young white woman. And next thing you know, they're killing people in town and rushed and ran everybody out so that's so like okay that's a long time ago right well we literally were uh we literally had black codes into the 1960s which means you couldn't necessarily you couldn't buy your home certain places you couldn't live certain places there was an actual threat of danger because people could just lynch you like lynchings were going in on into the 50s in the late late 50s so like if you got too successful like there's people who literally would get successful and hide their success because they wouldn't want to draw attention to themselves because they wouldn't want people to think they were uppity and then we just keep going so then after that you have the 70s the 80s you have all this redlining still like and then we get a little bit of something like you know after the 60s like they opened up a little bit we they're like okay we're gonna give you guys access to jobs we start getting a little bit of something next thing you know deindustrialization Like, and we're back here down the, we never got a chance to build real wealth. I guess that's what I'm really trying to say. Like people, the black, we've never had a black middle class. We've always Mm -hmm. only had a few token people who were able to make it out. But for the most part, most people are just down. And we, sorry, give me a second. It's just, it gets frustrating sometimes because 
it's so hard because like 50% of the homeless population in this country is black. Yeah. Like, and you have to understand after they released us from slavery, they released us to nothing. So people died of exposure, smallpox, like, where do you go? So here mm -hmm. we are now and our people are still homeless. Plus the eighties, we have the crack epidemic where we know that they allowed, um, you know, the Iran Contras to pump drugs into our our inner cities like all of this affects everything that has happened to us then so there are a few people who can work their way out of it but that's the same way for white people like yeah you know as a white person you might be a warren buffett maybe but the odds of it are very you know what i mean so people just don't yeah. understand it's it's like it's a lot when you start looking at the numbers and you see the data you start to understand so it's not through faults of our own like we go to school mm -hmm. we get college degrees then we either don't get hired or when we do we make less money you know we yeah. we try to buy homes but the neighborhoods that we buy our homes in they don't appreciate in value the only way they appreciate in value is if white people move in and then our property taxes go up and we can't afford it and we end up having to give up our homes gentrification like mm -hmm. everything we try to do to we try to start a business but we can't get the same loans we can't get the same help like if you have people look up what's going on with the black farmers like you know the farm subsidies pretty much keep farmers alive and they're being denied for these loans. They can't get this. Like we can't get a leg up even when we try, even when you're at your best. And let's just say you are at your best, right? Let's say you succeed one mistake. One thing goes wrong. You lose everything. You're back down to the bottom with everybody else. I'm sorry. I know that got a little long winded. But. No, it's, it, it's perfect. It's, there's also this heightened vulnerability. It goes to the drug war where if you are a mm -hmm. successful black American, well, you may do drugs or, or smoke pot at the same rate as your white peers, but who's more likely statistically to get locked up? And it's not a coincidence. That's what I think people need to realize is that we have to broaden our horizon. Universal programs are great, but if everybody rises and you have white people here and black people here, they just all rise at the same time, but you still have people who are down. And part of the problem is that our entire system has been designed to disadvantage Black yep. Americans. And that's not some unintended consequence. Our institutions are white supremacist institutions. And any policy that has been uh, uh, delegated to basically try to alleviate these issues, it's like playing whack-a-mole. You need systemic mm -hmm. reform because every single time there's been opportunities for uh, growth for black people, uh, there, there, there. It's like two steps forward, one steps back, and I'll, I'll give like my own personal example. So I used to commute um, when I lived uh, outside of Portland, and uh, this road that I would drive on, very, very uh, busy highway. I have never seen a cop a single time, not mm -hmm. once, not a single. So I would speed, mm -hmm. I would go fast, not even worry about it. And then I talk to my niece, who's a Latina, and her partner's black, and every time they drive that same road. Mm. they get pulled over wow every time and so to me being someone who has never had to think through these things not think about you know where i am where the yeah. police might be that really i mean it's not like i wasn't aware of this but white privilege is a thing that you always have to constantly put in check because this is something that you can't turn off like you can't you can't uh not be black this is part of your experience yeah. so I just imagine, like, I kind of try to broaden that. If you are someone who's successful, you're making six figures, you you own a house. Well, all that can go away. You could lose your job if some racist cop pulls you over and you get arrested for some bullshit reason. Yeah. So at every turn, even if you make it, you might not keep it. And that's that's the problem. And, and it goes back. This isn't just like a new phenomenon. It goes back to the history. I mean, this is one thing that I, I try to get across to people um, whenever reparations come up is that if you have an entire group of people who are slaves and you just let them go, what? I mean, it's like we see this kind of now and why the recidivism rate is so high. When you, people get out of prison, yeah. they have no families to go to. They have nowhere to go. So if because you do that to an ins family bonds, I was watching yeah. some weird. I watch random stuff. So I was watching something in Spanish <laughs> on Netflix about this woman in Port, you know, in uh, Brazil who killed her husband. But she gets to go home for a week, a year and spend time with her family. Yes, they literally let what? prisoners go home for period. They get furloughs for a period of time every year. Like, could you imagine if like not? I would like all non-drug 
nonviolent drug offenders to be let out. But could you imagine yeah. like nonviolent offenders were able to go home for a couple of months a year and if we weren't price gouging their people so they can't talk to them on the phone, like we're breaking those Jeez. relationships. Those relationships could be maintained, but we mm -hmm. make it so expensive that you can't even do that. And I wanna go back to your rising tides lift off boat. So this is Mud's thing, right? So mm -hmm. black people don't have boats. We are jet on the little wooden, uh, little wooden door with rows trying to climb up, and that is our dinghy boat. So we don't have dinghy boat. We literally have driftwood. Like <laughs> <laughs> that's a good, <laughs> that's a good analogy. Boat, we might fall off the driftwood and drown. <laughs> like yeah. no guarantees we're going with it. <laughs> and then the other part I want to put out there too is because I. I, I'm glad that white people are um, are confronting their white privilege, but mm -hmm. I don't want pe white people to feel like this is a guilt thing because mm -hmm. if you learn the history of this country, they taught you to hate black people. There were consequences. So Queen Mother Audrey Moore. Okay, so I'm gonna go a quick little thing. So after <laughs> because I because because I'm a his, I love history. So after slavery, there was a woman named Callie House who was a former slave. She literally went around and started organizing formerly enslaved people to try to get slave pensions from the government. This is less than five years after slavery. She had organized over 300,000 people. At that time, at five years after they're telling her, slavery's over, get over it, we don't need to give you nothing. There was literally money, there was literally a big cotton stock where they had seized from the South. And they asked like, do y'all still have that? Do you still have the money? They were like, yeah, we have the money. Then they. Are, uh, they tried to sue to get the money like oh there's no money so this reparations fight started a long time ago and it could have been paid a long time ago so the people who were in her movement they ended up going into the garvey movement and from garvey we had queen uh, we had queen mother audrey moore and there's a old uh, recording of her talking about you know um after slavery things were starting to get a little bit better for black folks they were starting to get things together a lot of black folks and white folks were working together and then there was the turn that's when the black code started. So white people who would work with black people, they would tar you, they would feather you, they would make it where you couldn't have employment, you would have, to, or they would kill you. There were real consequences. So when you think about that for generation after generation, let's talk about redlining, right? Let's talk about that. Let's say you are a good white person who doesn't hate black people, right? But if you let black people move into your neighborhood in the 60s, your stock, your um, housing price plummets because of white flight scare. And you could end up with a home or end up living in a neighborhood that's going to have no resources. So are you were you a racist or were you a person who so like they incentivize you to yeah. be anti-black? It's it's a setup right it, 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 if you really mm -hmm. think about it it's a setup and all of us have to not like not catch not fall into those traps right yeah but but you have to understand that there was traps that were created to condition people to become this way mm -hmm. and that's why you have to know you have to read history <laughs> i do so much Absolutely. history on the reset race podcast like we literally have watch parties where like we watch lectures which i'm amazed because like 100 people will like watch a lecture and I'm just like, okay, good. We're nerds. I like this. <laughs> that that's incredible. No, to get a hundred people to actually get educational information information is really, really incredible. Um, yeah, yeah. So I want to go back to your thing about white privilege. And one way that I heard it explained really well, which is because people don't with privilege, there's this like inherent assumption that oh, I'm guilty. I'm not guilty. I, I never did that. My my ancestors yeah. didn't. You know what I mean? Uh, but. One way to kind of frame it is it's not necessarily um, anything but a disadvantage that you don't have. So, for example, I could be impoverished just as any black American can be. But when I apply, apply for a job, statistically, I'm not going to get rejected because I have an African-American sounding name, which studies have shown that is the case. Or if I'm a white woman in America, uh, I am unlikely to be viewed as unprofessional because of my hair choice. I mean, all throughout the country, there's been disadvantages in every single facet of society, and it takes a very long time to unravel them. And the way that I think about it is the, the first step to actually tr building true equality is to put people on society in equal footing. And that's why I think that reparations is so crucial, not just as a social policy, but also as um, a legal debt that's owed. Uh, yes. I brought up a long time ago when I was talking to Michael Graham about reparations, you know, my, my father, my family didn't have much uh, intergenerational wealth, 
but my dad's great uncle died. I don't know if my dad even met him. And between my dad and all of his siblings, they got split money for his property that was so that mm -hmm. that was sold. And so they all got like five thousand dollars. And it was a really good demonstration of how generational wealth works. Work. Ooh, um, I'm so where, glad you got that. Uh, so so right. there was a, 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 was a Wall Street Journal article, and they're talking about how a bunch of Americans have stockpiled trillions of dollars, and they're about to give it away to their Gen Xers right. and millennial uh, 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 grandparent, you know, kids and grandkids, and they're talking about somewhere around two hundred and seventy-two thousand dollars. No, two hundred twelve, mm -hmm. two hundred twelve thousand dollars. That's going to be passed on to people. Reparations is two hundred and seventy-two thousand. So please don't fight me for my reparations when a lot of you are going to get the <laughs> same money that I need. I'm not coming yeah. for your. I'm not coming for your inheritance. So leave my money alone, unless unless you want to trade. Now, if you want to give up the inheritance, if everybody wants to start over, every generation like Black people, we can have a conversation. But that sounds like a terrible idea. Yeah. Well, and and you know, it goes more than just like um, that example. It, it goes, I think, deeper than showing how generational wealth transfers. But I think it kind of serves as a good basis for the legal argument because there was no question, like when my dad got that money, he got a phone call from one of his siblings who told him and he's like, oh, okay. It, it, he didn't have to fight for that. He didn't have to petition lawmakers for that. He just got it because it was a legal debt that was owed to him. And this is a way that I want people to conceptualize reparations. It's something that was promised but never paid. And it doesn't matter that time has passed. That doesn't mean that it's any less owed. In fact, if time passes, the more that time passes, the more that it should be paid. I mean, there's late fees for regular uh, citizens if they, exactly. they miss their rent payment. You know, if they miss their bills. So for that shouldn't necessarily be persuasive. I used to tax the life out <laughs> for those late fees. <laughs> I used to work at Blockbuster. You're welcome. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it's, it's so one thing that I was really hoping that you could put into perspective, and we do have some charts here, yes. is oh, I love my charts. I how love my I love that you're a nerd because this is I, I'm a visual learner. So to the have this is really beautiful. important. Yes. So basically, black wealth is disappearing. That's what we started this with. Mm -hmm. But the rate to which black wealth that exists, not that there's much, but that it exists is disappearing. Yes. should be frightening to every single person. Um, so can you talk to this? I do have some figures. I'll bring this up just for context here. But this yes. is something that I feel like should give people that extra sense of urgency for this issue if they didn't necessarily think that this should be a priority. Well, well this is good for people to see, right? Because some of our favorites on YouTube, they say that the black-white black wealth gap is only like in the top 10% of, um, of Americans. But if you look at this, you see at every rate, black people have less than white people, even when white people have very little. So if you look in like the first quintile, mm -hmm. you'll see like white, uh, white families have 950, but then black families will have negative 12,000. You go to the next one, 60, you know, almost 67,000, then black families will have less than 2000. And it's at every level, even when you get up to the top, black families that are in the top uh, quintiles will have like 324,000 and then a white family will have a million. So these people don't even live in the same neighborhoods or live together. So the thing about it is even though white people, white numbers, like we do need, we do need, we need programs to help with the disparity in white communities as well. But when you put them side by side, you guys have class. Black people really don't have class. The first three quintiles are under $25,000 in wealth. That's not class. That's poverty. Mm -hmm. And then after that, eighty-five thousand. That puts you. That puts you still under the third quintile for white people again. So you're a little bit. So are doing well, black folks, wealth wise, are somewhere like in the second quintile for white people, or right above that. Like people really don't understand that. Like the best and the brightest of black people are struggling, and their families mm -hmm. are struggling. And then another thing I like to point out is for you to be in the top 5% of black families, all you need is five, sorry, it's $350,000. I need people to understand wow. that because there is no way in life that you could reach the top 10% of white people by, or the top 5% of white people by having $300,000, like $350,000. So if you're a black person and you own a home in like Los Angeles or New York or one of those big markets, you were in the top 5% of black people, even if you were literally struggling to pay your taxes every year. Like that's wow. how bad 
what's going on in our community is. And again, it's not the failure of people not working hard. It's the system. The system has worked to literally take wealth away from many Black people. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing that I wanted you to kind of touch on is, uh, or kind of expand on, is systemic racism. I feel like leftists know that it's a thing, but it's hard to visualize it if you haven't seen it. And one example that I use is COVID-19. Mm -hmm. I mean, with this pandemic, um, it's not a coincidence that Black and brown people have died more from COVID, contracted COVID more. This isn't some random, it's not like Black people are going out and getting exposed to it more. It, we're all doing the same thing. But the reason why this is happening is because of the systems in place. At every step of the way, Black people are disadvantaged in this country uh, in ways that are not even conceivable to many people, uh, ways that we don't think about. And it, this is because it is embedded in our institutions. Mm -hmm. And you can't take that out easily. It has to be ripped out. Um, and it's a really difficult process. But I think that that really like you you can't. So when it comes to unemployment rates or anything, any other data point, it, you can you can try to come up with some bogus argument. Well, it's because, uh, you know, black people, they don't work as much because there's fathers in the homes. That's a, a racist trope that comes up. Uh, but when it comes to COVID-19, what's this is a new thing that we all learned about a couple of years ago. How do you how do you rationalize that if you're a right winger? Do you say, oh, well, you know, black people just like being exposed to what's the what's the excuse? Right. <laughs> It's systemic racism. So, I mean, could you talk more about systemic racism? Because I feel like people don't necessarily, like, they understand it, but it's kind of amorphous. Can you give, like, a concrete I, example of this? I feel like the best way to describe is, like, systemic racism. Let's talk about the school system, right? The, um, right. the school to prison pipeline, right? Right. So you shut, or you, there's so many things, but let's, let's start with the schools, right? So you start shutting down schools, or you don't put enough funding and resources into these schools, right? So you have schools that are under resourced underfunded, plus the communities are under-resourced and underfunded. So then when kids act up in school, because <clears throat> a lot of times, like, I, I didn't do a lot of acting up in school, but I was really smart and really bored. So mm. I, you know, but I saw other kids be punished for what other kids would do. But this is the thing with it. So you have kids in next thing you know, these kids are getting in trouble. Like you have uh, school resource offices, officers in there and they're, you know, locking up kids and taking kids to jail. And these kids are getting records in school and it starts to translate like what future does that child have? So you're in school, your school's underfunded. So you're not learning anything. They pass you along. And if you are smart and bright, you're still dodging your community. And if you're lucky enough to be smart enough to get out, you have to hope you were smart enough to get scholarships. You find a job where you got to go. Like there's so many facets to it. But for the kids who don't make it, you just pump them into the prison system and you warehouse them until they're in their 40s or 50s. And then you send them home to their families to take care of them for the rest of their lives because you're not going to give them opportunity. Like that's mm -hmm. one way that the system works. I remember I saw this really good TikTok video. I wish I could remember it where this gentleman went through and he showed like the levels of lynchings. And when the levels of lynchings go down, the prison system numbers go up. So they literally oh, wow. switched one thing with the next. Yeah, it's so that's a good way. I feel like that's a good way to describe it. And a lot of there's just a lot of other things like just the way the communities are set up, right? If there isn't a good bus transportation or good public transportation to the nice white community with the jobs, how do I work? Because there's no jobs in my community. Like this is before we even talk about if a white person will hire me, there might be the best white person ever who's there who wants to hire black people. But if I can't have transportation to get there every day, they can't help me. Like, yeah. so this is, it's there, like I said, there's so many facets. Like there's, it's just a lot. It's a, it's a system. That's why I need white people to understand. It's a system. Like nobody's saying that every white person is racist, but you live mm -hmm. in America. So you might be a little racist. And I say mm -hmm. that as a black American who grew up in the suburbs, it makes you a little racist. Like I had to learn mm -hmm. some anti-black shit. Like, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> I oh, no, learn, you can curse. Like, you know, but I had to learn a little bit of anti-Blackness. Like, I had to learn when I walk into an elevator with a big Black man not to be scared. Why am I scared? I'm with my people. But, <laughs> but I had to unlearn that just from growing up in the suburbs. Like, people don't understand. Wow. We, all watch, we all watch TV. The news mm -hmm. bombards us. Like, 
visual you don't understand the things that just shape the way you think without you even trying to as i said it's not about blaming you it's just about start looking around and if you don't know like just take some time to look up and read some stuff like i went to private school till i was in the eighth grade and then from then on i went to public school so i had a public school high school education nothing that i know about black history and to be honest nothing that i know about the majority of american history did I learn in school? I had to take time to educate myself on my own. So like, don't be a, don't, don't feel upset or bad. Like I have people like, oh my God, I can't believe I didn't know this. I was like, I didn't know this till five years ago. Like I just mm -hmm. read it in a book. Like just people have to, people, if you want to know, you just have to start making the steps and try. And then, you know, yeah. try starting to talk to some black people. That's another thing. A lot of y'all don't talk to regular black people. Don't talk to rich black people. <laughs> Stop talking to rich black. If she grew up in the suburbs with you, don't talk to her. Go talk to somebody else. You need to talk to somebody who grew up in the inner city or talk talk to a poor black person. Like, because once you do, you start to understand what's going on. But I think a lot of times, like, oh, I have a black friend. Well, your black friend's in the top 5% of black people. So yeah. you're talking to yeah. a rich Negro. I'm sorry, but like, you're talking to the wrong person. Well, and my response to the black friend thing is if, if it comes from a millennial, it's you don't have a black friend. We don't have any friends. We're millennials. We don't talk to anyone anymore. So don't lie. You're you're bullshitting me. So basically, you're, you've kind of given us just a little sneak peek of what you discuss on the Reset Race podcast. You have history lessons. You have really in-depth conversations. And basically, everything that I know, I know from Michael Graham, I, I, at least the, the intricate details. Mm -hmm. So uh, can you tell people basically where they can find this podcast, yes. what it's about, what you do, and why they should watch it most importantly? Because I feel like people, if you're hearing about reparations at length for the first time, you might not necessarily understand Understand it you might have questions but that's okay it, yes. this is a learning process and that we we live for what 80 years if we're lucky as human beings you're not going to get all the knowledge in the world it's you're constantly learning and, and this is part of the process and reset race is an incredible resource and i love that you do media critique media analyses you take what is being said the discourse and you break it down i i think it's 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 invaluable so explain where people can watch this set and, and kind of let us know what what you talk about okay so you can join you can come find us at the reset race network because we have a lot of shows but our but our flagship show is the reset race show so that show is basically we go and we we go through a lot of the we, we i say like the leftists the leftist progressives a lot of their talking points because a lot of them have some good ideas but when it comes to black people and black issues they just fall off the cliff it's it's embarrassingly it's bad yeah. yeah so our whole thing is to kind of go through and critique so we can let people who are fans of them like for a lot of them some of them yeah we want you to go away but the majority mm -hmm. like we just want you to talk about us a little bit too so we're hoping mm -hmm. from people watching us they'll start encouraging the people they watch like hey you know you can talk about black issues too we're okay with that like mm -hmm. we, we like black people too I, that's all we're looking for. So we really break down the arguments. The reset race show is a little raunchy. There's a lot of fussing and cussing. So definitely be be ready for it. But it's also like data and analysis. We mm -hmm. pull out everything. We'll pull out articles. We'll pull out charts. But we'll also pull out like clips from a movie. Like I, I pulled out the um, Weekend at Bernie's 2 clip talking about Joe Biden, how they dusted him off and resurrected him <laughs> to win. And I had weekend, I had Bernie doing the, the Weekend at Bernie's thing for Weekend at Bernie's I like that. I, don't, I, I feel like these days, like people, I'm like, some people know what you're talking about. Some people don't. But just Google it. You'll see it. It's yeah. hilarious for you. So we just try to keep it fun for everybody. And then we just launched a couple more shows. So, well, Bitter Dose has been with us from the beginning. So the Bitter Dose TV show has great analysis as well. And when you were talking about Reagan um, doing uh, doing reparations for the Japanese and the things that they were talking about, Mud did a whole Japanese internment campaign, uh, internment camp issue where for reparations. And they actually went through the hearings and everything else. Oh, it's so good. They literally use the same excuses now that they're giving that they gave the Japanese about why they shouldn't pay them reparations are the same excuses they're giving them now even down to white people won't like it and they might come for you and attack you again it's, it's too it's divisive textbook. it's so Interesting. textbook so we have bitter dose then we just started the John Brown leftist and that is all accomplices and ADOS people so we I think the total crew is like 14 but That's we incredible. average we average around 10 <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. But it's great. Like we have like a good uh, coalition. Everybody is there who is for reparations, but we're also trying to work on ideas for like how to, what our goal with Reset Race, the network is to start translating all of this stuff offline. We want to actually mm. teach people how to organize, how to not only just not use our ideas, but how to come up with their own ideas as well. So yeah. we're, we really want to see this translate onto the ground. So that's what we're trying to do with that group because it's a nice coalition of people. So we're going with that. I'm excited. And then we just got another show that was added, which is called The Hero Hunter, which is by Cash. And he literally goes through and he um, he takes down uh, like the George Washington myth, the Thomas Jefferson myth. So that's something that's really, but he does it like in a fun, interesting way. So he has like anime clips in it and like different. That's clips. awesome. It's really good. It's really entertaining. And then we're going to have an interview show that's going to be starting around Thanksgiving. So that's everything that should be coming out or is out this year. So we have a lot going on at Reset Race. Like you should definitely check that's us out. That's incredible. I didn't know you all had expanded that much. That's really incredible. <laughs> that we we move kind of fast. So <laughs> hey, <laughs> well, kind of fast, but when you see a need, you kind of have. Damn it! Sorry, my dog. My mom's gonna have to go get my dog. I can hear. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> I have dogs too, so I can totally understand. If you want to, if you want to bring the dogs on camera, that will score bonus points with the viewers for sure. <laughs> oh, this, is, this is my little. She she's a German Shepherd slash. Oh. <laughs> she's beautiful how yeah, old is she she's uh she'll be three months in two days so she's oh she's a puppy wow mm -hmm. she's a baby oh my god oh my well here's one thing i'll recommend for reset race if you do live streams uh do a dog cam so i started okay. doing that on twitch streams and the people show up for the dogs more than that's they show hilarious. up for me well that's good to know i'll just <laughs> yes. have, her, have her sit there and uh, abuse everything yeah sorry <laughs> no no problem <laughs> no well sam it, it's been so much fun bringing you on hopefully you can come back at another point in time um yeah i i, I, well, I love the recent us. i would love to i would love to and let me just say one thing uh, so people who are watching this they might tune in and see criticisms of their favorite media personalities but here's one thing that differentiates reset race from other uh, uh other podcasts it's good faith it's actually constructive and it's about learning not for clickbait, which is yeah. really, really important. People might see it and they'll be like, oh, you're attacking this person. But it's not necessarily an attack, it's more of a correction. And I think that that's so important because wh when it comes to issues like this, that oftentimes get co-opted. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, reparations with politicians, for example, gets co-opted and those, oh, I support reparations. When you mm -hmm. press them on it, do you? So it's important that you guys take the time to explain because I do think that that is crucial to the learning, uh, to the learning process. But Sam, uh, is there anything else you want to say before we before we wrap? Your dog is so cute. No, thank you so much. I just want to thank you for having us. Everybody come check out the Reset Race Network and, you know, bear with us. Like I said, we do beat up on your favorites a little bit, but we just want them to be better. Like the thing yeah. about it is the only way you guys are going to win is if you get black people to join you. Like you don't understand like black people, we don't have to fight against you. All we have to do is stay home. So like, mm -hmm. if you want to get people excited, like reparations is a way to get black Americans excited. You want Obama numbers for, for people you want, then yeah. you, you, we got to push them. And to be honest, we got to push them to do better for all of us because all of us yeah. are struggling. So, yeah. but yeah. if you fight with me, I'll fight with, I'll fight with, you know, if you fight with me for what we need, I will do the same. And like I said, I'm here for it. I, like people don't understand, like we, we, we watch all of the content creators. Y'all don't even understand like how many black people watch y'all and we'll start watching and some people like, oh man, they don't like us. Oh. And mm -hmm. we'll just fall off and we'll never leave you a comment. We'll never say anything about it. We just go away. And that's yeah. worse because you don't even know that you're losing people. So, yeah, you know, yeah. well, I, Oh, here's one last thing. So one of the ladies on the on the uh, John Brown left that she said when uh, when reparations came up when Bernie was running that it caught her completely off guard and she didn't even realize that there had been a reparations conversation going on. So for me, hmm. yeah, but I understand because you know there's Black Twitter, White Twitter, so she mm -hmm. just didn't fall into Black Twitter. But I think going forward for these next elections, like there's going to have to be a, a mixing of what's going on because. White yeah. people, when you hear black people are trying to fight for something, you can't just automatically dismiss us. It's very, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't make us feel good about trying to work with you. So, 
Mm-hmm. Even if you're not, even if you don't like what somebody's saying, just give them a minute to talk it out, you know, have, ask some questions and ask them, you know, in a, in like a, you know, well, okay, I'm just, in sometimes it's okay just to be like, look, I just want to ask a question to get some understanding. This is not an attack, just, and people will give you the information, but you have to actually start talking to us instead of just dismissing us being like, oh, you're just a bot or, oh, you're just a neoliberal. Oh, you just, you oh, just, li- listen, I hate Joe Biden. Joe, my, my, my <laughs> uncle literally this is the longest he's ever been out of prison since he was 18 years old. He is 50. He's like 56 years old. He was a nonviolent drug offender. He was just a drug addict. He was been in and out of prison his entire life. And Joe Biden's son is the same, has those same kind of issues. And he had a life. So Mm -hmm. I hate Joe Biden. So people are like, Oh, you're just neoliberal and you're just for the Democrats. And no, I'm for my people. I would like to see my people do better. And to be honest, I'd like to see the whole country do better because you know, I don't want the hunger games. Nobody Thank you. Mad Max. <laughs> that doesn't and, sound and, good. and for those of y'all who watch The Walking Dead, black people don't do well in this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 <laughs> y'all, y'all got too many guns and resources. Y'all are already ready for the end of the world. Like we are a little behind on that. So I'm gonna need us to come together now. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and let me just say that as a gay dude, I'm not an alpha male, so I would I would be one of the first to die in that scenario as well. <laughs> Man, you better find you a friend. <laughs> you better find you a friend. 